Um, thank you very much uh, for coming today and uh, for the opportunity to speak in this uh, wonderful forum. Um, uh, an overview of what I'm going to try to do today. Uh, I, I consider it um, a hallmark of human cognitive and cultural systems to be um, this remarkable uh, balancing act that we perform between structure and flexibility. And uh, all of you are familiar with the sort of grand traditions in the field of the uh, structured side, which uh, is characterized by um, explicitly articulated ways of dealing with representation and with process. Um, so there tend to be uh, hard coded notions, right, of what uh, what the knowledge should should look like, what the knowledge is, how the knowledge gets formed, how the knowledge gets accessed, how it gets used, uh, and symbols and rules tend to be the uh, bread and butter um, of this approach. And on the other side, we have the more flexible approach characterized by emergence, uh, statistical learning, content-based generalization, uh, and a, a commitment to a, a, a brain-style architecture. So uh, a great deal of work has gone into trying to model cognition or to create uh, artificial intelligence um, using kind of just one side or the other. So we can call that a one-legged approach um, on, this, on this viewpoint. And, um, uh, also, there's a lot of work that perhaps could be characterized as trying to bridge across the two perspectives. And uh, while there are, are certainly room for differing opinion here, um, there's, the, there's an argument to be made that these, these uh, hybrid approaches tend, tend to maybe give one leg or the other somewhat short shrift in the sense of how often do you find a hybrid approach that the advocates of, of of both worldviews are fully satisfied with. Um, and then there's even a no legs at all approach, uh, which is, I guess, a, a tip of the cap to uh, neo Gibsonian or, or anti representationalist stances that don't see much need for doing either of these things, uh, but want to pursue a different type of explanation. So I would like, uh, I would, I would like to um, suggest a path toward a, a a fully two two legged approach, um, and and the way to try to do that is to take this view um, that the more we assume from the start, uh, the more trouble we're going to see down the road. So so this led me to this uh, somewhat quixotic goal of trying to develop a mechanistic account of universal relational pattern recognition under uh, extreme uh, ma maximality of minimality of assumptions. Um, so by that, I mean, uh, don't assume anything about representations beyond uh, the, the, the bare facts of, of, of stimulus attributes. Um, and don't assume any complex processes, try and restrict everything that happens down to uh, a, a, a single generalized sort of default uh, um, playbook. Uh, and that playbook should be what can, how connectionists have sort of caricatured uh, the, the complexities of neural computation in terms of a, a simple activation rule that operates on the net input, which is just weights times activations. So like a neuron, can we, can we get out, can we get fancy universal cognition out of neurons? Oh wait, I guess we can, <laughs> but can we model it, right? Um, so uh, so is, the, is this possible? And, and then maybe could we possibly get for free some of the really uh, sort of high level targets that people have set for, for, uh, for modeling or for, for AI um, of, of getting systems that are, that are robust, um, that are transparent, that they, they, they don't fall apart, they don't do the wrong thing. You can tell why they're doing what they're doing uh, and they uh, don't just do one thing, but they can work in a wide range of situations. So I don't wanna spend long on this slide, but some connectionist assumptions that, that won't do or won't do relational pattern recognition. Uh, the, the 1980s PDP wave, um, I'm listing some of the sort of key design principles of that approach uh, that you would set some random initial weights and try to map from inputs to outputs to solve a task, uh, that usually these layers would be fully connected, that you would rely on what uh, Dave Ramahart uh, liked to phrase as uh, the principle that like inputs lead to like outputs, 
And when you need to, you can learn a recoding uh, through a gradient descent on task error. And today we have uh, a rejection of some of those, some of those principles to, um, to get some incredible systems that can do some amazing things. Um, uh, the notion of representation learning as a pre-process of saying, you wanna get the right representations of a domain before you try to do a task uh, has been extremely powerful. Um, that you uh, might wanna benefit from transferring learning on one problem to not have to start from scratch on a new problem. That you may not want fully connected layers, you may want restricted receptive fields, and you may want feature detectors that sort of violate the idea of direct generalization of, of like inputs. And this is some of the notions that make uh, convolutional neural nets so successful. Um, and then uh, the deep architectures that rely on tons of data, tons of layers, and quite a few tricks uh, to get them to do uh, the really neat things they do. So, uh, so that doesn't sound minimalist to me. So that's where I'm going to take a different path, right? So the idea is basically two steps. Um, one is that uh, when you face any problem, uh, do a default thing, independent of whatever your task might be, do some pre-processing. And that pre-processing is going to involve structure detectors, minimalist little, little brain style circuits that try to find structure in the data. And the core approach for how to find the structure is to look for pairwise identities in the input. So look for things that have the same value. So, so uh, Look for things that have the same value and note those. Now, it could be that there are other kinds of structural sensitivity that would be useful to look for. And it could be that hierarchicality would be good of having uh, looking for structure in structured recodings. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about those ideas. But this core notion is simply look for identities among the information you have. And then once you've got a recoding that's got the uh, results of the structured detector pre-process, then just use a simple, simple, simple minimalist old school neural net, um, and, but use the new representations rather than the original ones. So I came up with three design principles that kind of get this project off the ground. Uh, the first is this idea of restricting receptive fields. So you can see we've got a layer of, of, of inputs and then we've got a layer of these identity detectors. And each of them is only receiving input from a pair of input nodes. Okay, so that's, that's principle one, is this sort of restricted uh, overlapping receptive fields rather than everything receives from everything. No problem. Principle two, rather than learning weights for this pre-processing by gradient descent, we're just gonna use the most minimal possible circuits. And I, I prefer, these can be learned, uh, but it's, it's, it's easiest for, for present purposes just to imagine them as, as kind of fixed. So the weights are set to additive inverses of one another, so they sum to zero. Uh, they could be plus five and minus five. For simplicity, let's call them plus one and minus one. So that's crazy. We have a neural net where each node is only receiving two inputs. One of them is weighted with a positive weight. One of them is weighted with a negative weight. How is this thing going to do anything? Well, our third principle is going to build upon the first two. We're going to use an unusual uh, but fairly elemental activation function on the net input. Okay, So you can see the picture here, this Gaussian, the sharp Gaussian basically responds strongly to a to zero and rejects anything else. And K is a tolerance parameter about how, how sensitive it is. So basically this says, if the net input sums to zero, then this detector fires. Otherwise this detector says no show. So when we put these three elements together, these three design principles, we now have structure detectors, each one receiving from a pair of input nodes. The uh, activation is being weighted by additive inverse connections like plus one and minus one, okay? And those are being fed into a sharp Gaussian that responds only to identical values because identical values will produce 
a net input of zero. So just to work through the simple math, if the two inputs that are being looked at both have a value of five, you multiply one of those times positive one, one times negative one, and you get a total of zero. And you'll get a total, a net input of zero for any identical values. And for any non-identical values, you'll get a non-zero total net input. Then if you follow the little swirly arrows, you can see how a zero will lead to a high response from the Gaussian and a non-zero will lead to low responding from the Gaussian. So what we've built is a tiny little identity detector out of simple, simple neural computation. We've rejected full connectivity. We've rejected gradient descent learning to set the weights. We've rejected the notion of starting from scratch to solve a task because before we try to solve any task, the first thing we're doing is pre-processing it with these structure detectors as a default decision. And we're getting away from relying on direct generalization of inputs because we're not just using like inputs lead to like outputs, we're transforming or re-representing the inputs in terms of their structure. So let me just walk you through this. Uh, if you look sort of to the middle of the, of the figure, um, we have uh, an example of a recoding where an input uh, of 949 is getting recoded to a 010. And the way that's working is that there are three pairwise identity detectors. The first one looks at the 94 and says not identical. The second one looks at the 99 and says yes, identical, and that sharp Gaussian fires. And the third one looks at four and nine and says non identical. So what we've done is used three of these, uh, three of these brain style identity detectors with their sharp Gaussian, their inverse additive weights plus one minus one, and their pairwise receptive fields to transform 949 into a recoded version or pattern, which is 010. And that's what gets sent, sent on to a simple neural net classifier rather than sending the original information. An alternative to this kind of strict recoding would be what we can call ad coding, in which case we concatenate the original input and the recoding and send that on to the next step to us to a standard neural net classifier. So in that case, we'd be sending 949, the original information and 010, rather than sort of a replacement approach. Uh, very quickly, I'd like to point out that you may have noticed that so far we're basically dealing with kind of localist representations at the input level. Uh, and if we allow the notions of hierarchical stacking and heterogeneity of design elements in, we can, um, we can code up uh, a little circuit that allows this whole approach to extend to detecting, detecting identities uh, across distributed representations rather than across single uh, uh, pairs, pairs of nodes. So um, the way this works, you see we have the input nodes and then we have a set of identity detectors just like the ones we've been using. We're only gonna be interested now in the pairwise receptive fields for corresponding elements, the first input in the, in the first item and the first input in the second item. So those are the only relevant pairs. So whenever those, the first elements match, the identity detector will fire. When they don't match, the identity detector won't. So if all of the identity detectors fire, that means each of the sub elements has been found to be an identity. And then you can construct another little uh, structurally, structural detector that is sensitive to whether everything has fired. So the second layer says if all of the identity detectors are on, every single sub element is a match, then a threshold is reached for a simple step function that says that one fired, that one fired, that one fired, Okay, that's a total of three, that's above threshold, and the output node will fire saying there is identicality across these two vectors. And anything else, any mismatch along the way will lead to this node not firing. So this is a, a straightforward way to extend from comparing just two nodes to comparing two uh, distributed vectors. So now I want to talk about a couple of test problems. Um, many of you are familiar with uh, Marcus's work um, on uh, universal reduplication. So um, uh, he and his colleagues published uh, a, a paper in which they reported that infants who were exposed to triadic sequences of speech sounds like pa, ti, pa, 
uh, rapidly gained apparent mastery uh, as shown through their looking behavior of what Marcus called an algebraic rule, uh, like the ABA pattern. And what's uh, interesting about this is that it includes the ability to generalize to completely novel syllables. So uh, that would mean acceptance of li, mo, li, because it fits the ABA pattern. Uh, it would also show um, training independence, which means that when something comes along that's very much like an ABA pattern that's been seen before, uh, like pati ga, that needs to be rejected. It doesn't matter that pati ga is a lot like pati pa because it doesn't have the critical uh, relationship. So Marcus presented this as a challenge uh, to the prospects of generating fully rule-like behavior without explicit rules and symbols. So step one of our approach uh, is to generate this default structural recoding. So we don't care about the task yet. We just say, take the input, look at pairs, find identities. So if we take, uh, if we take um, uh, each syllable and translate it to a, a, a numerical magnitude, uh, we can have an example like 434, which fits the ABA pattern. And that's going to be recoded as 010, representing the pair that match and the two that don't. Uh, mi da ru would get represented um, it, as, at an input layer with, with differing values, and that's gonna lead to no matching pairs at the recoding, like a zero, zero, zero. Uh, something that has a, a, a reduplication other than the target one. So instead of ABA, it's ABB. Uh, an example would be li no no. Uh, that would translate, uh, so the input might be 977, uh, and that would lead to a recoding as zero, zero, one. Now we take seriously the actual task. And instead of using the original inputs, we now use the recoded patterns to train a very simple little neural net to learn a supervised classification task to be able to discriminate ABA patterns from other patterns. Uh, and uh, I was able to build a really minimal training uh, experience for this, uh, one hidden layer with three nodes, uh, only 100, uh, 100 passes of training over um, a, a small set of 18 patterns. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and keep in mind that I've, I've reduced it down to, the, to a localist version of the speech sounds, but as we showed before, it's, it's easy to extend this to distributed versions if one wished. Uh, and the result is total success. Um, as you can imagine, uh, as, you've, as you've followed through my description, um, any test item that fits the ABA pattern gets structurally recoded as a 0, 1, 0. So no matter what you start with, now you've got a 0, 1, 0, right? And so the classification problem becomes pretty trivial. It's just accept 0, 1, 0 and reject all these other things. Um, and as you can see, there's a, 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 a perfectly diagnostic predictor, right? The only time that the, that the middle value is on uh, is, when, is when it belongs in the category. And the only times that the other, the other values are on, it doesn't belong in the category. Uh, this leads to one kind of cool uh, mini phenomenon is that the only variable performance I found uh, came on uh, AAA test items. So for example, if you train up the system and then test it on a novel syllable, uh, fo, 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 um, you, uh, this gets structurally recoded as one, 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 because each of the pairwise elements has an identity. And in some cases, a trained up classifier uh, will, will consider one, one, one to be a fit to the ABA pattern because it has the critical reduplication. Uh, and in other versions, uh, a network can get trained up that, that rejects 111 because it happened to rely more on the fact that, that 111 shows uh, a, a recoded elements, right, or, or, or structural sensitivity that, uh, is not, that is not predictive. So, um, so I, I, don't know, I don't know what infants do with a 111 case or a fo 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 case, but that would be neat to look into. Um, just to extend on these results, uh, what I've presented to you used the, the recoding mode, right, where we actually replaced the original input with the, with the structural recoding. Uh, we get equally good results if we use the add coding approach of combining the original input and the re-represented input um, to, the, to the second step, to the multi-layer perceptron. And also, you don't need to use a multi-layer perceptron at all. 
because in truth, Marcus's original uh, task wasn't a classification task. Um, and so uh, we used an autoencoder as well that's trained only on ABA patterns. And we get the cool results that patterns that meet the algebraic constraint are well constructed. Patterns that don't meet the constraint get distorted. Uh, they get reconstructed toward the expected ABA outcome um, so that there is sensitivity to the ability to discriminate uh, ABA patterns from non-ABA patterns and also the ability to infer um, or com complete a pattern. So that's, that's promising. Um, it makes you wonder, can we get into more complex abstractions? Um, so I started to play around with this idea and I noticed that if you apply a bunch of pairwise identity detectors, you can get to a lot more interesting things than just reduplication. Uh, a, a pattern of, of alternating values would have a distinct signature in terms of which pairwise identity detectors would, would, would fire. Uh, symmetry would have a distinct signature of which pairwise identity detectors would fire. You could detect whether the ends match, you could detect where there's uh, full uniformity. That means every single, every single pairwise detector has to fire. Uh, you could look for full heterogeneity. Every single I pairwise identity detector has to fail. Uh, you could look for split homogeneous halves, all the, all the pairwise detectors in one region of the, of, of the input succeed while all, and, and, and uh, um, so uh, basically the, uh, the notion is that we can get perhaps quite a bit more out of this simple ability to detect matching values than might initially be evident. It's also quite easy to extend this. Uh, the uh, standard detector that I introduced to you, um, if we replace that sharp Gaussian with a step function, we can then have greater than or less than magnitude detectors, which opens up a further range of the kinds of interesting patterns that you could detect across the given information. And the only constraint here is that we're requiring minimalism, right? Whatever, whatever these little circuits do, they have to be simple activation rules operating over the net input. Um, I chose as another problem, uh, quadrilateral uh, classification, which was uh, introduced in the COGSI paper by uh, Kalman, Burke, and Hummel, um, where they came up with a, with a, a cool approach to uh, address the problem of classifying quadrilaterals into their mathematical classes. Uh, and they offered uh, some, some, some neat ideas about how to approach that. What I wanted to see is, I could, is if we could do it with these uh, pairwise identity detectors. Um, so the challenge is, can you learn from a very small set of examples and then be able to generalize to things that don't look anything like the original training set, but still fit the global abstractions underlying these quadrilateral types? Um, I wasn't interested in starting from the start of uh, visual processing, uh, so I, I, I chose to represent um, each figure by the side lengths and slopes. Um, and those can, those can be listed starting from anywhere, um, but in order, right? So the lengths in order or the slopes in order. Um, and just as a note, these could be, these attributes uh, follow directly from vertex coordinates if you wanted to start that way. Um, and so you can see here that each of these possible um, types of quadrilaterals uh, leads to a, uh, a signature in terms of um, whether the sides match and whether the slopes match considering each, each possible pairing. So we've got six columns here representing the possible pairings of sides and uh, whether we're looking at equal length or equal slope. You can see that there are opposing sides and there are adjacent sides. Um, and this, uh, this, con this conversion using just the default pre-processing of looking for identities is revealing the congruence and parallelism properties that underlie each of the core types. Um, but obviously you can't spot this now unless you're really good at looking at arrays of numbers. Um, the uh, square and the rhombus and the rectangle and the par parallelogram are not differentiated because they have the same signatures according to uh, sides, side length and, 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 and slopes. Um, they differ in terms of whether or not they have right angles. 
So to deal with this, we could either assume that right angles are encoded as attributes. I don't especially love that because it's got the word assume in it. Um, so I played around with whether we could get uh, a, slow, a, a, a right angle detector out of simple neural computation. And I actually found two ways. Neither of them is completely elegant because they require a little bit of playing around. Um, one, of them, one of them works just fine with our standard assumptions, except it requires taking an inverse of one of the inputs as opposed, or, or taking the reciprocal essentially of one of the inputs rather than just taking it as a straight value. So it's one over slope two. Uh, the other is a little weird because it's what we call a product unit. So instead of adding to get the net input, we would be multiplying to get the net input. Um, and uh, I guess the open question would be, um, given that those things might have a, a good utility here, would it be the case that perhaps a product unit or a reciprocal activation is sufficiently generic uh, and, and, and useful that that should be part of default pre-processing? So if it's the case that it is broadly useful to recode pairs of elements in these ways, uh, then it should happen kind of by default and whenever, whenever a new, a new uh, input comes in in a task independent way. And I haven't resolved that question necessarily. But when we do recode the patterns in terms of their, uh, whether or not each pair of sides is equal, whether or not each pair of slopes is equal, uh, and whether or not each pair of slopes represents a right angle, we can then get a unique uh, encoding of each of the possible types and any possible quadrilateral will map to one of those types. And then we train a multilayer perceptron uh, from the recodings to predict this six-way classification, again, using a very, very simple net. And the results are cool. Um, any old or new test item will be classified correctly. Um, I'm not gonna go into depth on this, but I'll spend a minute or two on this slide. Uh, could this approach lead to the rudiments of actual analogical processing? I will not make this claim right now, but I would like to just sort of play with the idea that if you took two cases of revenge, like Bill tripped Ted causing Ted to kick Bill, or Jill took Anne's prized possession causing Anne to spill Jill's big secret, um, the things that make, uh, that make these analogous or that make something belong to the relational category of revenge are a content match that the higher order relation is, is, is causal, a content match in the sense that each of the propositions has some element of hostility to it, and then includes this really important and cool thing of structural consistency. Uh, which is the idea that whoever is the, the agent or actor in the first proposition is, is, is the one uh, receiving, right, or the patient in the second proposition. Uh, and likewise, the patient in the first proposition becomes the agent in the second. So if we're to build vectors that capture the content, um, we could sort of do that and we could sort of uh, assign the different, the different roles in a way that is, that is role sensitive, but that's not gonna work on its own. That's gonna fall apart big time because we need more, um, as Gettner and Markman described it, we need more in the sense of representations that are gonna be similar to the extent that the items are not similar in the beginning, but are not similar in their, in their attributes, but are similar in terms of their structure. So if we applied identity detectors, right, what we would find is that we would have a structural sensitivity in the sense that one of these little identity circuits would notice, right, that there has to be uh, identity between the agent in proposition one and the patient in proposition two, and that would get recoded or perhaps better ad coded to the vector. So now you have a vector that captures what are the elements and what roles are they playing in the structure and what kinds of identities or what kinds of structural consistency needs to be maintained so that Bill Tripping Ted is only gonna lead to a, is only gonna count as revenge if what happens is reciprocal, right? But Ted doing something back to Bill. I'm going to stop there. Um, in summary, I think we have some successful tests of a minimalist brain style engine for universal relational pattern recognition. The cool questions are how far could this go? What kinds of things would break it? Um, and do we start to see signs of the kinds of robustness and the kinds of transparency 
and the kinds of domain generality that are, uh, in a sense, the, the targets that we're all trying to achieve in this kind of work. So um, I'd love your questions and feedback for, uh, we have a few minutes to chat. 